George Galloway, Workers' Party of Britain candidate, 12,003. I do hereby declare that George Galloway is duly... Do I respect the Prime Minister? I despise the Prime Minister. Just suck it up. I won the election. Where is Princess Kate? That's the question on everybody's lips, almost, in the United Kingdom and abroad. Where is the British Foreign Secretary, the phantom number two man in the British government who cannot present himself for questioning before the elected members of the House of Commons, for architectural reasons mainly? Where is that pier going? You know, the one being built with the skulls and the bones and the rubble from the destroyed houses in Gaza. Where is little Macron headed? Is he really going to march his legionnaires into Odessa? What could possibly go wrong? Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night because it is the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Last week, we had record numbers of views, millions of views, for the question, where is Kate? And the story hasn't gone away, you know. In fact, the mystery has deepened. Entirely contradictory photographs have been published, some of them falsified by Kensington Palace, by unknown photographers, and by a television producer who has uh, produced a video, not just a photograph, of what purports to be uh, the Princess of Wales and the Prince of Wales, the heir to the British throne. Not a fanciful matter because, well, he will be the head of state one day, maybe even one day sooner than we think or hope. The truth is that none of these pictures and none of these videos have been verified by Kensington Palace by the royal family themselves, yet they have been spun across millions of front pages, across hundreds of minutes of footage broadcast on television. Uh, the Let's start with the one in the car, not the one where she's turning her head away and you can see the back of her head and you're invited to believe that it is the Princess of Wales leaving for a separate engagement with the Prince of Wales an engagement he attended on his own. Let's leave that one, park that one to one side. I mean the one through the windscreen, which shows a rather fool in the face, Princess Kate. Not many believed that it really was her, or charitably they thought if it was her, she's been badly affected by whatever medication, steroids or whatever that she is on, because the Kate we remember from Christmas Day, which is the last verified sighting 
of the wife of the heir to the British throne was, well, rather more slender in demeanor. And then there was the one that was published in video form, supposedly of the happy royal couple skipping gaily through a farmer's market, though only one person out of all the people there thought to take out their phone and take a picture or a video of that undoubtedly joyous occasion. The problem with it is there is nobody in the land who believes that that looks like the Princess of Wales. Prince of Wales we can't see. He's got a baseball cap pulled over his face. Could be anybody, could have been me. But the Princess of Wales is in full view in the video. And if it is her, she has changed radically. Uh, not least, she looks at least 15 years younger than the last time we saw the mother of four on Christmas Day. If it is her, the rejuvenating effect of whatever medical treatment she's been having will be much sought after in the future by others. But it's not just that she looks remarkably younger. It is that she looks very different indeed. In fact, the unkind would say she looked more like the Marchioness of Cholmondley than she did look like Princess Kate, the Princess of Wales. But that would surely be a step too far. Why would she allow her chum from Cholmondley uh, uh, impersonate her in a farmer's market, stepping out with her husband? One thing is undeniable. The woman glimpsed through the front windscreen of the car and the woman in the farmer's market are not the same woman. One of those pictures might be true, but both of them cannot be true. Now, everyone and his dog has been warned that a royal announcement is imminent. It was said to be the middle of this morning. Then I thought perhaps the Prime Minister is going to announce something very important when he came into the chamber at 12 noon for Prime Minister's questions. But I knew from his demeanor, a kind of faux levity, and his blue rather than black tie, that he was not about to announce anything of great moment. And so, indeed, he didn't. So we're still waiting for a royal announcement. We know that the Scottish Parliament in Holyrood was advised that there would be a royal statement today of unspecified nature and scope. We know that because that leaked to the Scottish Press Corps in Edinburgh, but no announcement came. And so we're left still asking the question, what on earth is going on in the British royal family? Why have we not seen an authentic, unfalsified picture of the wife of the heir to the British throne? When will we learn exactly what has happened, either inside Kensington Palace, inside the operating theatre at the hospital that she unexpectedly attended? They say that it was scheduled, but it was not scheduled according to her closest aides, people who work with her every day, who had no idea that she was to go into hospital that day. No idea what ailment she has no idea the state of her health, indeed even her whereabouts. We'll be talking again to David Clues of Unity Network News, who was the proximate reason for the millions of people who viewed our clips on our last show. I've just spoken in the House. I have the dust of the House of Commons chamber on my boots. I spoke on Gaza, I spoke on the Iraq war, I spoke on little Macron's plan to march into Odessa, I spoke on the war in the Red Sea, the danger of a war with Iran, the war in Ukraine. I spoke about the missing foreign secretary. Here is why. We have a situation that we are simultaneously pontificating about the quality of other people's democracy about the quality of other people's elections when we in Britain have an unelected head of state, an unelected prime minister, and an unelected foreign secretary. Now, 
you can tolerate a business secretary like Peter Mandelson being in the Lords whilst being a member of the British cabinet. Frankly, no one much wanted to set eyes on Peter Mandelson. He was better wrapped up in a rodent's fur in the House of Lords. But when you are the Foreign Secretary of Britain in the midst, in the swirl of the most dangerous international events in my lifetime, certainly since the Cuban Missile Crisis, you cannot have a missing Foreign Secretary who cannot be questioned by the elected members of the British Parliament, who sits in what is quaintly called another place, which we're not allowed to go into. We never see him. We can't bump into him in the corridor. We can't see him in the voting lobby or in the tea room. And we, above all, cannot ask him questions. Sure, he faces questions by other rodent-wrapped members of the House of Lords, but that's not quite the same thing. Because we elected members have to answer our constituents about Britain's foreign policy without the ability to question the man responsible for it. This is untenable. It is an affront to democracy. Indeed, it is a farce. In tonight's debate, in which I spoke, we literally got into discussing where in the building could a lectern be erected from which the Foreign Secretary could address us, could be asked questions from us. We talked about which direction the microphones would have to be turned or returned into. How would we be able to speak through the chair at one end of the building whilst questioning a man at the opposite end of the building? And the rather leisurely uh, minister who replied to the debate literally quoted the precedents of the 17th century. 17th. Not 18, 17, not 19, 17th century. He talked about how there was precedent for bringing to the bar of the house. He mentioned two of them. The Duke of Buckingham's the only one that stayed in my mind, largely because he was called to the bar to answer for his lascivious lifestyle and behavior which had affronted the 17th century. British Parliament must have been pretty lascivious judging by the standards of the 17th century. He did mention that others had been summoned in the 18th century, including the Duke of Wellington, to answer questions from the members on the Peninsular War. I'm not making any of this up. This was the debate that took place not one hour ago in the House of Commons. And he did mention that the last person to be called to the bar of the House to answer questions was a Mr. Juna. I was, I think, alone of all the members present who recall Mr. Juna, John Juna of the Daily Express, famous for one of my favorite lines when confronted with Codswallop, he would turn to his uh, missing wife and say, pass the sick bag, Alice. And that is exactly how I felt at the end of the debate. 1957, 20, 24. And we have a missing aristocrat called David Cameron involved in Gaza, involved in the Red Sea, involved with the preparation for war being made by little Macron, about whom more later in a minute, involved in confronting China and the South China Sea, and none of us can question him as to the wisdom of any or all of these foreign wars in which Britain is up to a point embroiled. This is unacceptable in a country that calls itself a democracy and traduces other people's democracy whilst tolerating a farce such as this in our own midst. Let me turn to little Macron. I've stopped calling him little Napoleon because actually Napoleon, while short, was a man of substance, a man of stature who left a footprint 
across all of Europe and indeed farther afield. Little Macron will never be able to do that. He's more a Bourbon Dauphin sitting on his gilded throne in the palace of Elysee in Paris, ordering around imaginary armies. France has no army to speak of. The last time the French army was tested in a European theater, they folded like a cheap deck chair, allowing Hitler all the way to the Eiffel Tower in record quick time, faster than you could get there in an Uber today. They collapse like a cheap tent. They cannot successfully prevail against Niger, against Burkina Faso, but they're ready to fight the Russians. I need not mention that the last time uh, the emperor of France went to Moscow, he had to retreat a completely bedraggled and defeated figure. I could mention the last time the French were in Odessa when they were part of the war of intervention to try and reverse uh, the Bolshevik revolution of October 1917. They held Odessa until the then nascent Red Army of soldiers and sailors, workers and peasants, including women cavalry troops, routed the French and drove them from Odessa. The French army today is not what it was in 1920 and 1921. And the Russian army isn't what it was in 1920-21. The difference is the French army is much reduced from then. And the Russian army is super armed, super trained, battle hardened, and will make mince meat out of any Frenchman or woman foolish enough to be sent by this little Dauphin on this fool's errand to occupy Odessa. Odessa is a Russian city. It is a Russian national treasure, and it will be a Russian city again, whether over the body of Macron's French Foreign Legion or not. We must hope not, for enough people from France, more than any other country, have already perished in this ridiculous but bloody war in Ukraine, a war that need never have been fought, should never have been fought if it hadn't been for the scuppering of the peace deal arrived at in Turkey, scuppered by Boris Johnson, who he, where he, then none of this would be happening. If France had, had, and others, Germany in particular, had lived up to the guarantor role that they volunteered to take for the implementation of the Minsk II agreements, this war would not be happening. Ukraine would not now be partitioned, along lines still to be determined. All of the east of Ukraine is now and will forever be a part of Russia. The southern coast, including Odessa and linking up with Transnistria, will almost certainly be, before this is over, back in the Russian fold part of their ancient motherland, leaving a rump state, a rump state utterly dependent on the European Union and the remains of NATO after President Donald Trump has pulled the United States out of NATO. President Trump is coming. You might not like it. I don't like it. I'm not exultant in any way that President Trump is coming back. But I am exultant that President Biden is on the way out. That much is clear. Short of terminating the presidential bid of Donald Trump, with extreme prejudice, perhaps, a black swan event, a 1963 Dealey Plaza event, a 9-11 type of event, and Ron Paul and General Flynn have both warned in the last 24 hours about such a black swan event, by which they mean an unforeseeable, unexpected event that will change everything utterly in its wake. Short of a successful black swan event, Donald Trump will be back in November. And one of the things he's promising 
is to pull the United States out of NATO. But if any semblance of NATO continues to exist, if the fools in charge of European governments intend to continue to subsidize the remaining population of Western Ukraine, this rump state that will be left, then it will be a burden and a debt to all of you. Think Kosovo, but think a hundred, maybe a thousand times the burden, the weight that Kosovo has turned out to be. We know now that the British general election will be in the second half of the year. These were the words spoken by little Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, unelected of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Well, personally, I'm ready for it any time he likes. But I doubt that the so-called opposition, the so-called Labour Party, are looking forward to the fight. Sure, in the national opinion polls, if the false dichotomy is pitched, either Sunak or Starmer, Starmer wins. And he will almost certainly win the largest number of seats in the parliament. But I'm here to tell you that he will face an unprecedented number of unprecedentedly popular and powerful opponents for the Labour votes that he might otherwise have been able to count on. Not just the millions of Muslim voters who will not countenance voting for the genocide Labour Party, which is dripping in the blood of the Palestinian people, blood of tens, scores of thousands of Palestinians, most of them women and children, who've been torn apart with the active support of both the British government and the so-called British opposition. Millions of Muslims simply will not vote for that. Millions of young people who might otherwise have been excited about the possibility of getting the Tories out at last, will not vote for it. They will not vote for genocide. And so all the calculations of the British political class are beginning to have to be recalibrated. Keep your seats, fasten your seatbelts. It's low-key, up next on the mother of all talk shows. on YouTube, Keith Mitchell says, your success in Rochdale has made many, many more than just those who voted for you. As Roger Waters' mum says, do the right thing, George. Keep right with those in Rochdale and they will stand by you at the general election. I want to thank the great Roger Waters for his fulsome support in the contest. I want to thank Low Key, our own considerable genius, for coming to Rochdale and performing so brilliantly, so dazzlingly in the constituency. I want you all to write this down. I was listening today to Low Key's track, Long Live Palestine. And I always knew that it was musically extremely beautiful and inspiring. You know, the one with the chorus, free, free Palestine. But today, for some reason, in a car, I played it and I listened very carefully to the lyrics, which proved to me again that Loki isn't just a recording artist, isn't just an indefatigable activist. He is a professorial political genius. So write it down, Long Live Palestine. Watch it on Spotify at the end of this show by Loki, L-O-W-K-E-Y. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Well, 30,000 people have voted on the poll already, and I haven't announced it yet. Is criticizing Israel anti-Semitic? Yes or no? You can vote on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway, on my Twitter, 
Look for the blue tick on the YouTube community stream or on the YouTube feed that you're watching right now. If you are watching it on YouTube right now, please share it with all of your followers, all of your contacts. Ditto on Facebook, ditto on any other platform that allows you to do so. If you want to comment on tonight's issues, here are the numbers to call. It's toll free in the United States and Canada. And here is the number, plus one, 844-944-3344. In the UK and Ireland, equally free of charge, it's 0808 196 And in the rest of the world, it's 4420396-2625. Well, I've just been speaking about him in the highest possible terms. That's because that's how I feel about him. It's Loki, the recording artist, hip-hop artist of the first rank, host of the Watchdog podcast, and of course, an indefatigable political campaigner. Loki, welcome back to the mother of all talk shows. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you have a comment to make uh, on the situation now in Gaza, because I hadn't quite known that this peer to God knows where, that Joe Biden and his allies are building in Gaza was literally being built with the rubble from the houses destroyed by the Israeli Air Force and other munitions supplied by the United States, and that that rubble literally contained the bones, the skulls of the people who had been in those buildings before they were reduced to rubble. Now, I was suspicious, like I've no doubt you were, as to what the purpose of this pier was when there's thousands of trucks just through the gate, uh, the Rafa gate that could have been allowed in. But Netanyahu told us today what he thinks the pier is for. It's to achieve the illegal ethnic cleansing of potentially 2.3 million Palestinians out of Palestine altogether to points God knows where. What's your uh, observation on this? Well, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, um, George. I really appreciate it, and I want to congratulate you on your momentous victory in Rochdale. You really put the fear thank of you. God into the political elite in this country, and that is something we can all be thankful for. Now, in the case of this port being built um, on the edge of Gaza, what you had was last week a report pointing out that for a long time, Netanyahu and those around him had seen this as a very good way to control the population in Gaza. We also know that there have been massive deals for oil and gas companies to exploit um, the resources in and around the Gaza Strip. What we also know is that the US company that is vying for the contract is populated by and staffed by former uh, Defense Department uh, employees and intelligence um, agency figures from the United States. And the bill is likely to be footed by Gulf states, with one particular Gulf state already offering over 60 million to help with the campaign. And of course, it was also uh, published last week in the Israeli press that there are those within the Israeli political elite who will see it as the perfect uh, subterfuge through which the depopulation of Gaza can be sought in a way which is slightly less scandalous for Israel and its relations with Egypt, for example. We do know that the uh, Sinai Human Rights Organization released footage of camps being set up on the Egyptian side of Rafah um, with the intention of absorbing uh, large amounts of Palestinians. We also know that the Egyptian government received um, an increase in the loans from the IMF um, by over $5 billion, um, in fact, giving some clue 
as to what that may be for when looking at the massive displacement of human beings, which is imminent um, in Gaza. So, of course, the port uh, being built on the edge of Gaza will be multi, uh, will have multi purpose. Um, multi-purposes and also we know that the US are sending around a thousand soldiers to help with the construction of all of this so this is really a worrying situation indeed and a further stage in the ethnic cleansing and genocide of the Palestinians in Gaza uh, we of course uh, will have a change of president almost certainly in November but not a change of policy if his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, uh, is anything to go by. He said in an interview today, I think, uh, that uh, Gaza is a rather attractive beachfront property opportunity for Israel. And when asked by his interviewer, uh, but would that mean the Palestinians would not be able to go back? He said there's nothing for them to go back to. He encouraged Israel to bulldoze the Negev desert and transfer the Palestinians to there. I'm not saying that Trump will necessarily follow the politics of his son-in-law, but it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Well, of course, it's known that in the 90s, when Benjamin Netanyahu used to visit New York, he actually stayed in the bedroom of Jared Kushner while he was a young man playing basketball in university. Jared Kushner has performed a vital uh, t role for the Israelis in terms of integrating them um, both economically and even militarily with several Gulf countries. So for example, the Shaldag unit, which led the first raid on the Shifa hospital is equipped by a company called the Shlomo Group. This is an Israeli um, vehicle uh, company. But this company, the Shlomo Group, is owned by something called Affinity Partners. Now, Affinity Partners is Jared Kushner's own initiative that is funded by the Saudi government, meaning you have Saudi money going into currently equipping the Shaudag unit, um, which raided a Shifa hospital. Extremely scandalous, but that could not have taken place without the hard work of Jared Kushner. What we also have to remember about the Trump factor in all of this is that in 2007, a handwritten note from the Benjamin Netanyahu political campaign was leaked to the Israeli newspaper, which uh, Y.net is its website, now, this handwritten note had on it the names of uh, potential funders for the uh, Benjamin Netanyahu political campaign. And one of the names on that list, alongside figures like Sheldon Adelson um, and uh, uh, Rupert Murdoch, which is seriously concerning considering the level of media influence that Murdoch has had in Britain over the decades and around the world for that matter was of course Donald Trump as well. So the relationship and the kinship and the affinity that exists between Trump, Netanyahu and that particular Jabotinskyite uh, thrust and manifestation of the Zionist movement um, cannot be underestimated. And so for the next phases of war that Israel is likely to launch in the region. Um, you know, Biden has gone over and above to demonstrate his fealty to this uh, push by Netanyahu. We can't forget that across this period, uh, the United States has carried out a hundred secret arms deals with Israel. Israel has bombed Gaza so much over this period that it is now using ammunition uh, surplus ammunition from the Korean War in the 50s from the United States. So really, it is a bipartisan orthodoxy in the US, this servility uh, to Israel. So we must be concerned for the days ahead.
Well, uh, bipartisan servility is, of course, the order of the day here too, but not hitherto in Ireland. Uh, we've, I, I, I'm not a fan of uh, Leo Varadkar, the outgoing Taoiseach, Prime Minister of Ireland, but I thought he spoke very powerfully, eloquently and bravely uh, to the face of Joe Biden about Gaza, about Palestine, uh, in Washington just a couple of days ago. And three days later, he has now tendered his shock resignation. Are these two things in any way connected, do you think? Well, of course, as you will well know, uh, George, Ireland has the claim to being a neutral country. But what does that neutrality actually mean? It means the United States military has free range access and use of Shannon Airport. It means that the Irish military has been involved in training Ukrainian forces in the light of this NATO campaign against Russia. But more worrying than that is something that took place during the reign of Alan Shatter as Justice Minister in Ireland. Now, Shatter is a well-known Israel lobbyist now, but in his previous um, his previous role as Justice Minister, he went on record as claiming that the <clears throat> the very recording systems that are operated within Irish police stations, the the infrastructure used by the elite units of the National Bureau of Investigation, the Criminal Assets Bureau, um, and other key institutions in the Irish security state were replaced with recorders from a company known as NICE Systems. Now, NICE Systems is a subsidiary of Elbit Systems, which is Israel's largest arms company. So what you have here is a state which is on paper pro-Palestinian, certainly actually having Israeli infiltrated uh, intelligence infrastructure built into it. In addition to that, very concerningly, over the past uh, decade or so, an outfit by the name of Forward Thinking, which has a um, director by the name of Chris Donnelly from the Institute of Statecraft, who brought us the well-known Integrity Initiative. Um, it has other figures involved in it who are either former or, in the case of uh, Chris Donnelly, current British military intelligence. This organization, Forward Thinking, has worked for many years to organize meetings between Likud and Sinn Féin, and those meetings have taken place. This form of normalization and this targeting and the use of Ireland really as a laboratory for a lot of these projects has taken place. So while the political elite in Ireland is being pushed into making pronouncements, you will well remember that this statement being made was something that took place after a campaign calling against uh, Irish politicians from going to the United States on St. Patrick's Day. So while it, it, it obviously was an emotive uh, speech which connected with many people across the world, the mere meeting of Biden was really a demonstration of US power um, in this uh, situation. So it will be interesting to see what happens next in the Republic of Ireland. Now, uh, you're, of course, uh, a giant uh, figure in, in show business, in the world of uh, hip hop and so on. I wanted to ask you your take on the extraordinary events, all in the interests and in, in the name of freedom, of course, uh, that took place around TikTok in the United States last week, where TikTok has been ordered to be sold uh, to an American company or maybe an Israeli company, maybe both. Uh, but TikTok is to be banned in the name of freedom, even though hundreds of millions of views of TikTok from the American public are recorded daily. What's your take on that? Well, let's remember this, George. A lot of the propaganda around TikTok is aimed at convincing people in the United States that TikTok may be spying on them for a foreign government. 
Well, let's be clear. The US Department of Defense has its data handled by a company by the name of Oracle. Now, Oracle is the brainchild of Larry Ellison, one of the closest friends of Benjamin Netanyahu. And Ellison actually offered the directorship of Oracle to Benjamin Netanyahu, meaning Netanyahu stood to be the director of the company that handles the data for the US Department of Defense. In addition to that, Larry Ellison is the largest donor to the Friends of the IDF charity, which funnels funds directly into the Israeli occupation forces in the history of the organization. So you may have some of some form of an issue with national security, but it's certainly not from the Chinese. And even Nancy Pelosi went on record just a few days ago, saying that Netanyahu attempted to interfere in US elections. But also let's deconstruct these allegations against TikTok. Well, actually, contrary to what they will try and tell you, there has been an attempt to infiltrate and control TikTok, but it hasn't been the Chinese. No, the content policy lead for TikTok Canada, for example, is a gentleman by the name of Alexander Corbeil, who is simultaneously the vice president of the NATO Association of Canada. Another interesting example of an employee at TikTok who is an ex NATO employee is Ford Copeland. We don't know if he is a relative of the famous CIA man, Miles Copeland, but he previously, before working in trust and safety at TikTok, was a desk officer for NATO and the Department of Defense. Now, something which I published myself was the current feature policy manager of TikTok is a gentleman by the name of Greg Anderson. Now, according to his own LinkedIn profile, in two th until 2019, Anderson worked on psychological operations for NATO. After I published information about that, he changed his LinkedIn profile to not mention the psychological operations aspect of his work at NATO. You also have Bo Patterson working as a threat analyst for TikTok's trust and safety division. Now, between 2017 and 2020, Patterson was a targeting analyst for the CIA. What we also know is Victoria McCullough, who previously worked for the Department of Homeland Security and for the White House itself. She now works on trust and safety at TikTok. And another interesting figure at trust and safety at TikTok is Christian Cardona, who spent 13 years in senior roles at the State Department. What we have to see happening with this TikTok is a convergence of different interests. So on one side, you have the war hawks of the US regime who have been seeking for a long time to make TikTok a sacrificial lamb in their propaganda war against China. But what you have on the other side is the Israel lobby. Now, at the beginning of the genocide in Gaza, the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL, which let's, lo let's not forget, the ADL is so deeply considered to be a proxy of Israel that even the FBI in an internal memo in 1969 wrote the following words. It is incredible to assume that information given to the ADL is not furnished to an official of the Israeli government. The ADL, it shares funders with uh, uh, illegal settlements in the West Bank and the friends of the IDF. Now the ADL came out and said in a, in a, in a private recording which became public, uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, the head of the ADL, said, we have a Gen Z problem and a TikTok problem, pointing specifically to young people using TikTok to pass around information about Gaza. Now, the ADL has spied for decades for the uh, Israeli government. You have examples of them even spying on Desmond Tutu, um, for the apartheid regime in South Africa. And so this campaign to push TikTok into other hands, we now see the pro-Israel stalwart and uh, treasure, uh, Secret Secretary of the Treasury under uh, Donald Trump, Steve Mnuchin, has stated his intention to gather investors under his umbrella to buy TikTok. Now, we don't know if those investors will include his close friend, Yossi Cohen, the former director 
of Mossad, who Mnuchin previously asked to join his other investment fund. So it's certainly interesting what will happen next. But what we do know for sure is that Israel is seriously concerned with the free flow of information, even in a limited way, as is made available on TikTok. I told them you were a genius. Loki, as always, a tour de force. Thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. You can comment on what you've heard so far. Uh, it's free, toll free in the US and Canada. Plus one, eight four four nine four four double three double four. Free of charge in the UK and Ireland, 08081 and the rest of the world on 442039662625. I'll be right back. Stay tuned. There's a group of people in Twitter who are daily posting discussions about Gaza, Lebanon, what's happening, news updates, aid for Gaza. Uh, and trying to enlist the help of Jordan and France and any other regional entity that will help get more aid into Gaza and all of Gaza, all of Palestine, for everyone who suffers. So I want to request that everyone who is listening to this go to your local council meetings and peacefully request that their representatives at the local levels do this because it works. Thanks for the call, Pia, in Uruguay. I'm a free man of the city of San Francisco, awarded to me for my work on Palestine, on the steps of City Hall itself. So it was a particular delight for me that the San Francisco Council voted by eight votes to three to demand a ceasefire. And that decision didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of campaigning to force the local authority representatives to vote. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. The polls going well, 31,298 have so far voted is criticizing Israel anti-Semitic, yes or no. And the podcast is doing extremely well too. Please don't forget, you can download it from wherever you get your podcasts by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. Now look, on YouTube, my channel is currently at 395,000 subscribers. If you haven't subscribed, please do. I want to get... Of course, because I like even numbers. I want to get to 400,000 subscribers. Try and let's do that by the weekend. Search YouTube for George Galloway. Let's go to the lines. Now, this is the perfect encapsulation of my promise to put Rochdale on the map. It's Jordan in Sacramento on Rochdale. Jordan, welcome. I'm actually currently in Los Angeles, but I go to school in Sacramento. Um, so, but I'm very happy to be on the mother of all talk shows. Thank you. Yes. Well, I, I did just want to, um, you know, I called in and your and your people got back to me, and uh, I had a very uh, particular interest. Uh, you've been what, what I want to say a bit of a of a usurping, but very. Uh, uh, pronounced uh, figure in British politics recently, have you not? Yes, that's one way of describing me. I'd put it uh, that I'm a disruptor of the uni-party uh, system. The two cheeks of the same backside. Tory, Labour, the cheeky boys, you might call them. Yes, yes, you're, you're the disruptor of the rear end, as you could say, for uh, mainstream uh, British uh, political uh, dynamic, you're, you're shifting the dynamic. Um, I, I was just calling in, and I, I, I was I was telling your people that uh, you're, the, um, you're doing a very uh, good job 
and um, I want not just shifting the dynamic, but really kind of harping into the uh, public sentiment, you know, the existing public sentiment that doesn't just exist in the UK, but of course across the aisle in Ireland, where they're very uh, prominent uh, activists and, you know, man, many sects of civil society are uh, very displeased about what's going on in the situation um, in, you know, in, um, in the Middle East and in Gaza. But, you know, one argument that I haven't been hearing that I really would like to hear your opinion on is Britain's role in all of this. I mean, you know, we can't just look at this as a foreign policy issue, but also one on post, a post-colonial issue. Um, I really wanted to shed light on this because, you know, Britain was, you know, was the former colonial holder uh, for the territories of Israel, Palestine, and would eventually become the Gaza Strip. And I really would like to hear from, you know, the newest uh, MP who won a, who I want to say a very, won a very splendid and, uh, um, you know, but, um, you know, un, not an unnoticed uh, by-election, um, whether or not you think this post-colonial approach will be beneficial in getting more people and tapping into existing public sentiment um, to really to be on board with understanding that we need an immediate ceasefire for the region, and Britain has an obligation to do so, given its former, um, you know, its its, its historic um, uh, presence in the region and its former um, just, you know, deep. Yeah, well, thank you, Jordan. Uh, I have done so many times. You can find them on YouTube. I've spoken in Parliament. I recall one in particular back in 2008 uh, when I made the point that we are the author of the entire Palestinian tragedy uh, when we uh, promised a uh, second people the land that belonged to a third people, unique even by imperialist, colonialist uh, standards. And we didn't even possess it as a colonial possession at the very point that we promised it to a second people who did not in any case represent their own people. Only a tiny, sl slim number of the world's Jews in uh, the 1917 supported Zionism at all. The vast majority of Jews opposed Zionism when the British Prime Minister, Mr. Balfour, promised to the Zionist movement, tiny minority movement, uh, the land that belonged to the Palestinian people. So it's not just that we have a normal, ordinary colonial responsibility here. We were uniquely the author of this entire disaster, this descending staircase into hell, bathed in blood and gore. We are responsible entirely for it. And it's the main reason why I have, for more than 50 years, uh, concentrated on this subject. Because, uh, you know, I'm not uh, Norwegian or, or uh, Colombian uh, with uh, a normal, healthy interest in the human rights of people thousands of miles away and their oppression. No, I am a citizen, indeed more than a citizen, a member of the parliament of the country uh, that is responsible for this disaster in the first place. So, yes, I can, I do, I always will place the Palestinian story in the context of Britain's imperial story. Uh, James is in Doncaster, wants to talk about Keir Starmer. Go ahead, James. Hello, George. Yes. I concur with the previous speaker and uh, every, all the news media forget about the oppression in the West Bank that's been going on since the invasion of Israel. Never mind. Keir Sama. The trick with Keir is to make him look really stupid because the public actually can't stand him. And the best chance to defeat him is get him out of office, a bit like Rishi before the election. And you said it yourself in one of your broadcasts that Sama was wooden. And you nailed it there. We can both tell he's stupid just by looking at him. Since mm. resigning as DPP, he took first national offers being pompous 
work from the Tory government and immediately after declared the Tories were ourselves. This is about being a Labour MP with a single ambition for number 10. You may recall... Yes, uh, uh, he's, I, I described him, James, as so wooden the birds were trying to uh, nest in him. Uh, people were uh, um, pasting him with chrysot. People were varnishing him. He's the most wooden, clunky, uh, uh, unoriginal uh, member of the parliament I've ever come across, never mind the putative prime minister. Uh, and, of course, uh, if uh, compared and contrasted with little Rishi Sunak, uh, you might say that any Labour leader would be streets or ahead. Although, actually, I was in at Prime Minister's question time today, and I thought little Sunak gave him a thorough beating, actually, and landed uh, many blows uh, on, on Keir Starmer. So... I think the polls are misleading. I think his party will do far less well than they are currently anticipated to do. Uh, but the Tories are not credible either. The Liberal Democrats, still less credible. have been in Parliament over the span of five decades, if you can believe that. Uh, I was elected in the 1980s, and I'm still a member now uh, in 2024. And in those five decades, I've seen many prime ministers, many leaders of the opposition come and go, but the current crop are literally in some cases political dwarves. They are midget. It's a bonsai parliament that we have now, certainly a bonsai uh, but umbilically tied front bench between the government and the opposition. Thank you, James. Uh, Carl is on the line. Uh, he says the pier is for feeding ships with gazans. Very good, Carl. Claire Gillies says it's like a horror movie with no ending. Indeed, it is. And Carlito Chakra says these are dangerous days. To say what you feel is to dig your own grave. That's a quote from the one and only late Sinead O'Connor. Dagmar Gross says George Galloway, and this format is what we have needed. Thank you. Uh, back to the lines then. Gloria is in London on Palestine. Go ahead, Gloria. Yes, George. First of all, I must congratulate you. I was so elated. I can't tell you the joy you brought me when you won that election. Anyway, Thank you, um, Thank you. I, was wa I watched the news. I'm an 85-year-old woman and very political minded and I was watching the news and then I watched an article this morning and it says that Jared um, Kushner is suggesting to make the whole waterfront and the Mediterranean Sea there, make it like a luxury hotel and a sort of all business he's talking about in Gaza. And I yes, was very I saw upset. that and in yeah, you're right to be upset, uh, Gloria. I, I, I suppose he only just stopped short of saying he'd build it himself. Uh, but, of course, this could only happen, Gloria, if they clear all the Palestinians out of Gaza. Uh, because, I can assure you, the Palestinian resistance uh, will not uh, tolerate uh, Israeli tourists strolling along this luxury waterfront unimpeded. Uh, so what do you think they're going to do with the 2.3 million Palestinians who actually live there? Yes, and also um, they're trying to, uh, this, um, and the Americans also, they're trying to say they're going to build something by a pier by the sea. I think they know that there's oil there and they're trying to try to see how best to get rid of the Palestinians and take it all over. Yeah, that's the very deep fear we all have, Gloria. Thank you for that glorious call and for your very kind words. Just before the break then, it's Steve in Canada on the Royals. Go ahead, Steve. Hello, Mr. Gallery. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, first of all, I'd like Welcome. to congratulate you on your uh, tremendous win there in Rochdale. And it's nice to see a man who's honest and with integrity back in the Parliament uh, what Thank I'd like you. to say about the key thing is, do, 
So you believe that uh, this is all a distraction for the main things that are going on around the world, uh, the seriousness, you think they're just trying to distract the public with this? Well, they're trying to distract us from something, uh, whether it's what's going on around the world or what's going on inside the royal family, uh, I suppose will become clear in due course. Uh, but there's a massive distraction going on, that's for sure. Uh, at least one of these photographs that have appeared in the last couple of weeks is now provably a falsification, a deliberate falsification from Kensington Palace, as we now know. Uh, the others, well, only one of them even could possibly be true, the picture through the windscreen or the video at the farmer's market, only one of these two could possibly be true. That is, unless both of those are also proven false. We'll be talking about it, Steve, with the David Clues, the lead correspondent for UNN, with developing news on the royal family this very evening. Steve, thanks for that call. I'm going to take a quick break and then I'll be right back with the aforementioned David Plews. Where is Princess Kate? That's the question he'll be asking. Stay tuned. There is hope. The hope is in our numbers. We're already boycotting all kinds of products and it's working. They're all reporting significant drops in profit. We need to boycott. We need to protest often in numbers and with imagination when we get the opportunity to vote out the parties that are supporting the genocide, we must take them. And if that opportunity isn't yet available in your area, you need to make it. You need to join with people intelligently, shrewdly, in a way that will punish the incumbent genocide enabler. You can link up your church with another church, your trade union with another trade union, your community organization, your nursery, whatever, with another in Palestine. You need to reach out to them so that they know that people in Canada and in Britain and everywhere in the world are thinking about them because that is important for their morale. We're entitled to feel a kind of gut-wrenching sadness at what is going. We're entitled for our hearts to be broken, but we're not entitled to allow our spirits to be broken because the people there are depending on our spirits. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Well, just under 4 million people watched the mother of all talk shows in the last week. And a lot of those numbers came for Kate. They came for our discussion about the big question on the lips of many people in Britain. However, they like to pretend they have no interest in the matter. Where is the Princess of Wales? Well, David Clues is the man in front of this particular story. He is the lead correspondent of Unity Network News, and he joins us again now. David, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, how would you summarize where this story stands this evening? Well, first of all, George, thanks again for, for having me on and for the, the, the warm welcome from your audience again. It's it's just incredible. And I think the media and the royal family are relying on the fact that the vast majority of people just skim the headlines. They don't look deeply into things. As we are now on the 20th of March, it is unequivocal. Kate Middleton hasn't been confirmed being seen in public since the 25th of December. There is, the, 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 that's, 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 the, that's the blatant fact. As you rightly pointed out, we've had 
a, a flurry of activity over the last two weeks and all of it has been completely debunked and proven to be untrue. You had the Mother's Day photograph that was released that what wasn't just touched up, it wasn't just slightly, you know, uh, some filters put on it. it. It was a complete fabrication. Before that, you'd had the picture of Kate when she was supposedly in the car with her mother, except she was looking exceptionally bloated. And then at the weekend there, um, Monday, son runs with the story that Kate has been seen at a farm shop with William and the the media are running with this like it's normal and I, I, I just, I, I, I'm quite happy to go on record and just say that quite clearly the um, young lady in that picture that is with whoever that gentleman is is, is, is clearly not Kate Middleton and like she, she doesn't look anything like Kate Middleton, and you've you've got a preposterous situation where the head of the BBC disinformation unit, Mariana Spring, is is talking about people pushing conspiracy theories. Well, I, I, Kensington Palace have not confirmed that this image was this video was Kate Middleton. I I I I have speculated. I mean, look, just look, look, look at that photo. That's been put through an, an, an AI um, software to, to, to enhance what that person looks like. And it it's clearly not Kate Middleton. Um, my my speculation on this issue, and, and I put this out on the night of it, is that the individual involved, a gentleman called Nelson Silva, has worked with two actors and they've 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 tried to do this because Remember, when the royals visit somewhere, what, what normally happens, the BBC, Sky, ITV, they'll go around and they'll speak to the shopkeepers, they'll speak to the staff. Oh, how was it? To... There has been one person gone on record and we're now supposed to believe the 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 Sun newspaper. Uh, Kelvin McKenzie, famously, who was the editor at the time of Hillsborough, said, this this video puts an end to the conspiracy theories. This video puts an end to the speculation when quite clearly it, it doesn't do anything of the sort. Well, uh, it certainly hasn't uh, stopped uh, thee and me uh, from speculating. Mm -hmm. Let's look uh, more closely at the image of uh, Kate in the video. Uh, it might look passably like what Kate Middleton looked like when she was 19 or 21. <laughs> yes. It does not look at all like the Kate Middleton we saw on Christmas Day, does it? No, 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 no. I mean, she is, I believe, is she, is she 41 or, or, or 42? Let me just actually find out exactly what age she is. This is somebody that looks clearly, as you say, in their very early 20s 42 she's 42 in her very early 20s or 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 even younger I, I i mean it's it's farcical that they're trying to actually pass this off as real it, it is it's a gaslighting operation on on an incredible level and as i say the the, the i think people at the bbc and not that they're reputable journalists but they know that this isn't kate middleton but I think they'll be working behind the scenes to try and identify who who these who these actors are and 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 what's going on. But the fundamental remains: the royals know about this speculation. They know everything that's going on. This could be solved within a, with a five minute video. TV crew, a couple of journalists could go up there. They could interview Kate Middleton in her house. We would then be able to do all sorts of check on the video, run it through AI, and, and that would be it finished. And they're not capable of doing that, which begs the question, why not? Why aren't the royal, Why can't the royal family yeah, do that? Yeah, I mean, not capable or not willing. Uh, let's speculate then. Why would uh, rapacious, rat pack mm -hmm. journalism like The Sun, why would they willingly go along with uh, what, uh, you say, and I suspect, uh, is a fake video that isn't Kate and isn't even 
necessarily, William. Why would the sun go along with that? Well, it's interesting. Someone's just put in the chat, it's as bad as the IDF propaganda. I think we're now in a post-truth stage and the son of maybe run the numbers that they'll put this story out and they'll make X amount in advertising revenue. And if it turns out it's not true, well, it's paid for itself. And it very much is that IDF model. Well, we'll just lie. We'll just push it out there and it will stick with enough people. And they, they, they've maybe just decided to, to run with that. Um, but I, 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 it, is, it, is a, it is an excellent point. Apparently, Rebecca Brooks, uh, I believe, let me just again double check that, that you know, that she is still in, involved in it, but she signed off on it to get it out. And the, the, the story that they're putting out as well was that it was um, 200K um, payment that was given to this guy, Nelson Silva, um, that that um yes yeah, rebecca brooks would That's still a lot be of the money CEO. for a grainy video uh the sun well, would need to right. ask and for that back if it turned out not to be true although i'm sure the lad uh took care of that in the contract but uh, i've asked you about why the sun would go along with all this um let's speculate as to why the state would go along with all this as you rightly say uh never mind a video Never mind the BBC going in for a video. Why don't they publish the actual Mother's Day photograph rather than the one that they falsified? Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that kill the speculation? At the very least, we'd know just how rejuvenated Kate was now looking. Because there was no Mother's Day photo taken. It, it was a, it was a mishmash of, of, of others uh, that, that, as your 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 team are putting up there, you know it's it's a Vogue photo that they've used and they've implanted that within. So there is there is no original to release. It's completely manufactured and made up. Um, and and we said last time there's I I think there's three possibilities of, of what is going on. Firstly, she's dead, which I think is a bit of a stretch. I, I don't think that's correct. Secondly. She is in some sort of vegetative or mental state where she's incapable of of speaking, um, or thirdly, she's downed tools. She is she has said, "I am not doing any media, I am not doing anything," which again leaves open to the speculation as to why. And it's it is it, it, a lot of your audience are asking, and it, it is accurate. Is is there a bigger game at play? Because you've had Jeremy Vine today coming out saying, well, maybe we should just shut down Twitter. And you've got all these people saying, well, look at what these conspiracy theories are leading to. So I think there are going to be a lot of elements within the British establishment that will use this as an opportunity to beat people. But look, they are blatantly lying to us, George. This isn't this isn't as if they've released a video. And, and again, this would be a bit of a stretch if I was on saying it's a clone or... It's someone wearing a mask. That that would be a stretch. They are blatantly lying. They've not released a photo or video of her since the 25th of December. It's as simple as that. Yeah, uh, and w I mean, obviously one hopes mercifully that if those are the only three options, that it's the third option, that she's down tools. One uh, doesn't wish her any... Uh, ill health, uh, least of all wish her death. We must hope then that it's just that she's on strike. Uh, yes. You know, like the lady at the ticket office in the local railway station. She ain't going to take it anymore. Uh, <laughs> I suppose the question then would be, what on earth would drive the wife of the heir to the throne to down tools? Well, and again, this is where all the speculation has come in, and there's there's been a huge amount of speculation. We we were discussing in detail the the, the apparent suicide of Thomas Kingston, the uh, son-in-law of Prince Michael of Kent. He went out with Pippa Middleton. I mean, there, there's a lot of rumours floating around there, and I, as I say, it's all speculation. William has been a very naughty boy, and um, he's he been involved in affairs. Apparently, he does have a very very bad temper, and there's. There's, there's all sorts of speculation and fundamentally this speculation could all be put a halt to if the royals came out and were honest with people and then 
the amount of people that are out, well, just leave them alone. No, the, the royals are, are paid for by the taxpayers. They are fundamentally, they, we are not their property. They are our property and we, we deserve to know what, what they are doing. Um, but they are treating us with this level of disdain and contempt. But is is it, 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 it's just I think the fact that you and I are focusing on it, George, and and many more are. It's the I've never known anything like this. I've seen a lot of crazy stuff in in the years I've been involved in politics, and especially over the last six years, I've never seen anything as crazy as this. Especially just the the one drama to the other, which which again adds fuel to the fire, though that they're doing this on purpose and are, are they actively trolling the British public? Are they are they wanting people to, to speculate for certain reasons? Yeah, I, I mean, that is, of course, another layer of, uh, of conspiracy theory, which doesn't mean it isn't true. Uh, but uh, uh, when I sat down in the chamber for Prime Minister's questions just before little Rishi Sunak came in <laughs> to the chamber. I heard the cheering. I could scarcely see him above the table. He's so <laughs> diminutive. Uh, but I knew from the cheering that he'd come in. And when I looked on my phone, I saw that a uh, royal announcement was trending. Uh, by the time the Prime Minister finished, it had disappeared from the trend list. But I was fully expecting a statement today. Mid-morning, I had been told, and when that didn't happen, I thought, well, the PM must be about to make a statement. Uh, but uh, that didn't happen either. Uh, who's leaking that there's going to be a royal statement and then there isn't? I, I think there's obviously competing factions within within the royal family. They, they, there's a lot of animosity, whether it's between Kensington Palace, Buckingham Palace, or, or with the Sussexes over in in Montecito I think there's a lot of bad blood um that that, that exists there and yeah the, 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 we don't know about the health of of Charles either and it, it, this is another interesting thing though is people say it's not important I, I, it, this is important it, it really really is you cannot underestimate the amount of soft power the British monarchy still holds and the, just remember what what on October the 7th what did the first thing Charles do brought in the chief rabbi and 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 told him that the the, the the people of this country stands with with Israel they they were they are the, the royal family are a critical piece of the apparatus in the, in the wider Zionist games at play and and massive supporters of the state of Israel as is Prince William you saw with his visit to the the synagogue so they are they are big big players in that and and yes in some ways it has taken minds and eyes off of Gaza but I think anything that exposes the royals and the as the liars and the hypocrites that they are and if they're supporting this genocidal entity in the Middle East I think that can only help the the, the people of Palestine and their struggle. Well, uh, Her Majesty never did, of course. Uh, Israel was practically the only country in the whole world that she refused to visit. She never visited it. And I think that's because she could still hear the echo of the bomb that destroyed the King David Hotel and so many British uh, servants of the crown uh, with it. I've got to put this to you, David, uh, because my editor insists that I do. And so mm. I quote, uh, on the 28th of January, Kensington Palace issued a statement saying Kate is recovering at home from planned abdominal surgery after 13 days in hospital. And web rumours are just that, rumour at the moment. There's no evidence to suggest William has been unfaithful and no evidence to suggest Kate is anything other than recovering at home. But we await a statement from Kensington Palace. Your response, please. Oh. <laughs> They've been lying for months. And the fact that there needs to be the mention of, of William's extracurricular activities, um, I, th I think, says it all. And, and as we discussed last time, people, people think that royals are some... Oh, that they're just like you and me because the press brainwash you shows you like Kate visiting Asda and they're like, oh, she's just like me, who and me. They aren't. These people 
spend more money on on a lunch than you would spend in an entire year, okay? They, or, or 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 on a trip somewhere or a pair of earrings than 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 you would you would see in a lifetime. Royals have affairs. Royals sire illegitimate children. They for many of centuries murdered people. You can't. To think that they would just all of a sudden stop behaving like that, it's like if you domesticate a Rottweiler, they're, they're not going to start just, you know, forgetting their instinct and forgetting who they are. So I think every statement that's come out of Kensington Palace is a lie. I mean, they, they've, not, they, they've not even seen anything recently. And if it was a three-week convalescence, if it was three weeks, then wait, where is she? We're now on the 20th of March. We are no further forward. Uh, well, uh, Jeff H. has got a new conspiracy theory. I'll put it to you, David. She's in the Glasgow Rangers trophy room with Lord Lucan and Shergar. Any truth to that one? <laughs> well, well, it's, it's perhaps been a bit bare recently, the Glasgow Rangers uh, trophy room recently, but I'm, I'm sure she would still be noticed <laughs> as, well as, as, as well as Lord Lucan um, as well. David Clues, lead correspondent for UNN Unity Network News. Thanks very much indeed for your Thank speculation. You, Let Appreciate me take that. a quick break and then it's your calls all the way to the end of the show. The airwaves. This savannah is a rigid detoxomy of fact and fiction. As vicious as the Twitter sphere where the slightest misjudgment can spell being cancelled. One species rules over the airwaves through its ability to adapt and survive in even the harshest environments. The George Galloway. top cat in these parts, it is mostly active on Sunday evenings in Britain and mid-afternoon in the United States. It seldom roars during the day. Most notable for its wide variety of headdress, it protects these parts from the mainstream media. You can catch this fine specimen on the mother of all talk shows. Don't pick a fight with it. They've been known to bite back. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Thirty-three thousand three hundred and forty-one of you have voted. Get your vote in now. In the next twenty minutes, is criticizing Israel anti-Semitic? Yes or no? The phone numbers again: U.S. and Canada. It's toll-free plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. U.K. and Ireland free of charge: oh eight oh eight one nine six double five double two. Worldwide number 442039662625. Sean's on the line from Northern Ireland about Kate. Go ahead, Sean. Hello, George. Uh, just a couple of wee points I wanted to make to you tonight. Um, the first being yep. Kate and um, that video, supposed video of her. Uh, if you look at the person on that video, and you look at a screenshot, say, of Kate, the, the teeth do not match up, the, the, her ears do not match up, nothing matches up about her. And as you said, uh, the other one with supposedly her mum in the car, she has, like, a real chubby face in it. So it can't be her, any of them. And as they say... No, I mean, one of, these, the, uh, one of these pictures could be real. But they can't both be real. I think that's the point, Sean. Yeah, but as the as the royals always have body doubles, like uh, 
Winston Churchill did in World War Two. But um, the other thing I wanted to chat to you about was uh, the peer building in, in Gaza. <clears throat> now, right from the outset of that war, um, BP had been give, given the plan or given permission to drill for oil possibly in and around the Gaza coast. Now, they found oil and they found a significant quantity of, well, natural gas and oil. And ever since then, uh, there has been just an absolute frenzy to get this pier built. And I would say just to get rid of the Palestinians and living in Gaza, kick them off into the Sinai Desert and get that natural gas out, share it between America and Israel. And plus, there is a plan afoot to build a new Suez Canal straight through Gaza to bypass Egypt and the amount it's costing them to uh, come through there each mm. year. Uh, I was well, of know course, there are two problems with it. Uh, the first is uh, the Palestinians have got to agree to get on the boats, and some might, but most would not. Uh, so they'd have to be forced onto the boats at gunpoint just as uh, Jews were forced onto the cattle trucks at gunpoint uh, in the capital H Holocaust. This would uh, be very bad optics to say the very least. And the second problem is, where are you going to take them? Uh, where are you going to sail them to from this pier? I mean, we're not talking about dozens, hundreds, thousands. We're talking about millions of people. Where? Are they going to sail these Palestinians too, even if they can get them on the boats? That is a very, very, very significant couple of questions. Sean, in Northern Ireland, thank you. Nina is in Kansas City on the Israel story. Go ahead, Nina. Yeah, hi. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm really, really upset about this. I mean, you know, I cry every day every time I see a story about it. And um, uh, my husband, he just, he literally told me, I don't care because they're born um, terrorists. And I was like, what? And I'm like, who are you? You are a monster. I'm like, I'm thinking about like, I don't even want to be married to you anymore. I can't look at him. I mean, it, he has no soul. Horrible well, I don't want to give you marital advice, Nina, but... Uh... There's definitely going to be uh, pillow fights in your house, uh, given your feelings and what you describe as his. I can only hope that he was uh, merely exaggerating to rile you. Nina, thanks. I don't want to dive too deeply into your household affairs. David Rogers says that Kate is in the Rangers trophy room with Bible John. You need to be of a certain age to know what that means. Crokey says... George Galloway MP, if you were voting in Ireland, what party parties would you vote for? Uh, well, probably Sinn Féin, but probably holding my nose as I did so. Uh, Sundar Nagarajan says, I did not know Larry Ellison of Oracle could hand over data to Israel. Get them off the defence contracts. And Monkey Boy says, a house-to-house -house search in Montecito, California should immediately be conducted. Rand is on the line in San Francisco. Go ahead, Rand. Yes. It's an honor. First of all, it's a big honor to talk to you. It's a big honor. You're one of the, my you. favorite person Thank in the you world. So you know, and, and the, the difference between, I'm Thank a third you. generation Palestinian American, the difference between us and you, that we have to do that. It's our, it's our fight. It's not your fight, but you fight this fight for, for the kids. And we really, really, uh, uh, we okay. really, really very grateful to have someone like you. Congratulations on your winning. Thank you. Man. And your voice is very important for millions and millions in the world. And from this platform, I would love to ask each American citizen not to vote, not to any one of our president, whether it's Trump or Biden, because they're both, uh, you know, they're both going to help in this genocide that's happening. And we don't need any, any court 
in the world to tell us that this genocide has been committed because this genocide has been happening for 75 years. It's not. And the, and the, the problem is that, that the world does not understand that, uh, that the Palestinian resistance or Hamas, whatever they want to call it, it's, it's, not an, it's not a group. There are ideology. We, they will have a different group coming uh, each year, each, each month. Because after you, kill, after you kill everyone for a person, after you kill all the environments of the person, what do you expect from them? After you take their land, you steal their land, what do you expect for them? And the, the, the other thing they don't understand, it's not only in Palestine. The whole, the whole Middle East is with, the, with this fight. And we call them Palestinian resistance. They're not terrorists. It's not, a, it's not, it's not terrorism to, to fight your country, you know, to, to defeat your country and, you know, to fight for your country and, and fight for, for against all this killing, you know. So uh, I would ask them just to... Well, to thank you, Rand, for your uh, very kind uh, words about me personally. And I think you're right. And any sensible person would have concluded this right from the beginning, that uh, however many... Uh, resistance people you have killed in Gaza, you have made more resistance fighters in Gaza and outside of Gaza. The radicalizing power of this slaughter in the minds, hearts of Palestinians and many others uh, is, of course, multiple. By It's uh, exponentially larger than any number of Palestinian fighters they managed to kill. And even they don't claim that they killed any significant uh, resistance leader in the course of 166 days in which they managed to kill, wound, maim, uh, or uh, bury under the rubble well over 100,000 people. But not one of them was a significant commander, leader, recognizable name of uh, any of the Palestinian resistance factions, who are not, of course, only Hamas. There are many uh, resistance factions fighting the Israeli invasion of Gaza right now. Thank you, Rand. Dominico is in London uh, on Mick Lynch, the real women's leader. Go ahead, Dominico. Uh, uh, hello, George. Um, thank you for taking my call again. Um, yesterday I was yeah. at the Apathy event where you were, and uh, thank you very much for uh, for your time. Um, I, I missed okay. the, the the opportunity to ask a question there, and that's why I'm calling now. Um, but before do, before before I do that, I would like to just make an observation about yesterday uh, that I was surprised to see in the audience quite a few people still being um, entangled with the official narrative on the Ukraine, and therefore asking questions that were clearly um, uh, denouncing blind the fact that they were, were not really very well informed about it. And that's, that was one thing that just surprised me in an audience that I expected to be more mm. educated about these matters. Anyway, um, the, the actual question I want to ask is, um, would it be possible, thing? would it be feasible or something that um, can occur in the future for your party to have some synergy, some working together to a certain extent with with the union led by Mick Lynch, and uh, um, mm -hmm. and asking also, I would like to ask you, what do you think of Mick Lynch? I think that the way he talks. Well, we would like that very is, much, Dominico. What I think of Mick Lynch is, I think very highly of Mick Lynch, and I have been associated with formerly the National Union of Rail Women and now the Rail Maritime and Transport Union, its successor, uh, since I was a very young man. I remember speaking at their ADM, their uh, annual delegate meeting in St. Andrews uh, in, I'm pretty sure, the 1970s. It might have been the very early 1980s, but I think it was in the 1970s. Uh, and so I... Uh, love uh, the RMT and its strength and its willingness to use that strength. And of course, the late and great Bob Crow, formerly the leader of the RMT, was a close friend of mine for many years. So, of course, uh, we would love such a synergy. 
the RMT is not affiliated to the misnamed Labour Party. They at least have taken that step and we would very much welcome uh, their affiliation or even a semi-detached relationship with the RMT and the Workers' Party of Britain. On the event last night, it was rather odd. Um, we did not control the event. Tickets were sold, uh, £11 each, and a lot of people bought them. And they bought them to come along and attack me on one or other front. It was also in a circular uh, model, and therefore it was difficult to keep looking over your shoulder. Uh, and I had some anxieties about the uh, issues of personal security. I don't think those that are uh, paid to look after me would allow me to accept an invitation like that again. But thanks, Domenico, for coming and for the call. Uh, now, a message from my producer. I've had one from the editor. This one's from the producer. We've taken dozens of calls tonight from people who are trying to vote on the poll. You can only vote on Twitter, Telegram, and YouTube. Please don't call in with your vote. It won't count. Only use the phones to come on the air to talk to me. Patricia is on the line from South Carolina on Palestine. Let's hear from her. Go ahead, Patricia. Yes. Hi, George. I just wanted to make a comment or make make tell you my observation. I got in touch with you when, right after the, the October 7th, and we had a conversation about uh, what might have created this, this is, issue. And then I also uh, talked to Scott Ritter when he was on. Both of you agreed that, and that, that it isn't the only thing, but it's, it's the money that's involved with the oil. I, I look at it this way. You can't have... Uh, a worldwide global pro protest going on with millions of people all over, and the neocons are ignoring it. I'm telling you, there's money to be made over there where Gaza is, and they want to kill every last one of them to, and, and get whatever it is done they want to do. And that peer is to go in there with, this is what I think, go in there with what they need to rebuild Gaza, but it won't be Gaza. They have money to be made there. There's a lot of money that can be made there, and you didn't disagree. You said it wasn't the only reason. Scott Ritter basically said the same thing to me. But I'm in the bottom of, in the pit of my soul. It's about money. That's well, it. a lot of things in life are, uh, Patricia, and I didn't disagree with you last time. I'm not going to disagree with you this time, except to enter the caveat I did last time, which is that's not the only reason. And I'll go further. I'll say this. If there was no oil and gas, off the coast of Gaza. None. Not a drop. If there was no possibility of building a canal there, the Zionist state would still be trying to extirpate all the Palestinians from the land because they are ideologically dedicated to a land free of Palestinians. I'll not translate that into German, but I think you got my drift. They do not want Palestinians in Palestine. And if they could, and if they can, they will drive every last one of them into the sea, into the desert, over to Jordan, over to Egypt, anywhere they can to clear the land of Palestinians. That's the land that was once, in the memory of some people still watching this show tonight, called Palestine. Thanks for the call. Uh, Patricia, Queen N. Jinga Lives says Napoleon's army was roundly beaten by the first independent black colony of the formerly enslaved Haiti, and the West never forgot or forgave it. Indeed, Haiti was still paying compensation to the French for having kicked them out uh, until uh, modern times. Talos says Macronian has been blown apart. Very witty. The legend that is Sarkar in Glasgow is on the line on Starmar. Go ahead, Sarkar. Uh, George, thank you so much. And George, you can call me Sarkar the Disappointed. I'll tell you why. <laughs> See, I'll be honest. 
I can understand Tories are getting a bloodbath in this election. But I'll tell you what I'm much more worried about is when I see someone called Keir Starmer, who's next in line to be the Prime Minister. I personally think, if not more dangerous, he's as bad as Tony Blair. I'll tell you why. When Diane Abbott was racially abused as a leader, your job should have been start fighting tooth and nail, standing shoulder to shoulder for someone who has been an MP multiple times than you. You didn't. When Gaza was being bombed, instead of asking for a ceasefire, David Lamy and you, David Lamy who cries racism at the drop of a hat, kept on justifying Israeli actions. He, did that and he should have asked for a ceasefire. Tony Blair got the full support of Rupert Murdoch during New Labour days. Yes, he was a charmer. That's a different thing. We all know what he came to be afterwards. Ask Iraq. But Keir Starmer, he may not be a charmer. Starmer, charmer, I never know it rhymes. He may not be a charmer. But believe me, George, he may be as boring as a furniture. But he won't be doing any good to this country. He will be another Tony Blair. The only difference is that, without the charm. And... I don't think so. Anything good will come, even if a Labour Party comes. And the saddest part is Labour Party is a party of Barbara Castle, of Tony Benn. But now, ever since Tony Blair has been the Prime Minister, we have Keir Starmer's and Tony Blair's. Over to you, George. I'd like to hear your views. Well, brilliantly put, uh, Starmer ain't no charmer. Uh, that's not just poetic. It is undeniably true. He talks like a Dalek. He talks like a robot. He moves like the Tin Man clunkily. He is unable to think and move on his feet, and he's so wooden he uh, deserves uh, to have birds nesting in him. Sarkar, as always, brilliant, pungent, all the way from Glasgow. Dennis Curry says, Franco burned books, Pinochet burned books, Hitler burned books, America burns the internet. Well said. Rabia Burak says, his reply to piss moron, sorry, I mean, Piers Morgan was epic. The way he said shut up to Piers moron was so refreshing. Someone had to tell it to him long ago. On the line in England, in Norwich, is Kaspar. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Kaspar. Hello, George. How's it going? You all right? All good, by the grace of God. Thank you. Happy days, happy days. I'm going to keep it short and sweet. I just called to congratulate you for being elected again. And I believe you're an honourable an honorable gentleman even before you joined the House Thank of you. Commons. And yes, that's it. I will hope Most one day kind, that... Kaspar. Uh, brevity is the soul of wit, as the Bard said. And I'm grateful for your uh, brief but kind uh, remarks. Uh, this is my seventh parliamentary term. Uh, I've served in the 80s, in the 90s, in the noughties, in the teens, and now in the 20s. That's a long time to be in Parliament. I came up on a lift there when two fellows who didn't look like young lads uh, told me that when I came into the House of Commons, one of them was nine, nine years old, uh, and uh, he didn't look like a young thing to me. So uh, it was at that point I realized just how long I've been in this building. It's a long, long time. A lot of blood, a lot of water under the bridge. Thanks, Caspar. God bless you. Jacqueline is in South Wales. Let's hear from her. Go ahead, Jacqueline. Oh, hello, George. Congratulations on your win. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, i just like to say, I've emailed the Speaker today in the House of Commons because I can't understand. This is the third week running now and you haven't had a voice. Is there anything that you can do to make him make you have a voice, Flip? Uh No, but um, he'll be influenced by people being unhappy about it and uh, that's people in the building. I spoke to David Davis today. Uh, who the Right Honourable David Davis, Conservative grandee, uh, and he told me that he had raised with the Speaker uh, why I was not being called. He gave uh, an explanation for week one, he gave an explanation for week two, when he didn't even call Diane Abbott, though almost the whole of question time was about her, uh, but he had no excuse for not calling me today. Uh, so I didn't go to a reception that he had invited me to after Prime Minister's questions because 
I wanted him to know uh, that I'm very angry indeed about it. I was, after all, subject to a full prime ministerial press conference on the steps of number 10 Downing Street. I surely have, at least three weeks later, some kind of right of reply. However, I did get to make a quite an extensive speech this evening, uh, which you'll find on social media already and be able to watch in full uh, in due course. Thanks for looking out for me, uh, Jacqueline. But the, the truth is, no. Uh, uh, if he never calls me, I will never be allowed to speak. But luckily, I have bigger platforms than the House of Commons. I can speak so loud as to be heard well beyond those walls. But most kind of you to notice and to be upset on my behalf. Let me go live to my good wife, Gayatri. What's rattling, Gayatri? Well, good poll you got going is criticizing Israel anti-Semitic. Jonathan Wood on Patreon says, of course not. Church and state were divorced hundreds of years ago in the UK. So the same state can't possibly therefore conflate these two in the artificial construct they spawned in Palestine. And Northern Sai says, well, only if criticizing Russia is orthodox Christian phobia. Uh, and I would add to that, uh, criticizing Saudi Arabia would be Islamophobic, right? Very well argued and unanswerable, actually. Uh, I don't know how they would even begin to try and argue that. How many times have I criticized Saudi Arabia in the strongest, harshest possible terms? Was I attacking Islam because I was attacking a state which claims uh, to be an Islamic state? That would be ridiculous. No one would even attempt to argue that, would they? Any more? No. Ray Greasy says, today Obama was seen entering 10 Downing Street. What is up? Are he and little Rishi Sunak dating? Is Obama here to help find Princess Kate? Or is he trying to borrow a new chef? <laughs> well, that's very funny. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't, if I was uh, Barack, uh, go for a Downing Street chef. The standard of catering around there isn't all that good. Though it might have improved now that we've got an Indian in number 10. Maybe you get a good curry there, although it would be a vegetarian <laughs> one with him because he's a Hindu. But nonetheless, it might be tastier fare. But the last time I ate in number 10 Downing Street, it was <laughs> stodge personified. So I doubt if uh, Barack was in there looking for a new chef. He has lost, unfortunately. I mean, to lose one chef by drowning uh, is uh, unfortunate. Uh, but to lose both of your last two chefs in waterborne incidents uh, is uh, positively baffling, mystifying. Uh, I don't think they're dating. As far as I know, they're both uh, heterosexual men. Uh, so what does that leave? Uh, all I'll say is this. No good can come of it. No good can come of Barack Obama padding uh, menacingly into Downing Street in the current world situation. All right, so Stephanie Carroll reminds us, the entire US war on Vietnam was an intentional massacre of innocent, impoverished, unarmed civilians, mostly women, children, and old men. One veteran whistleblower called it a my lie every day. The only difference was in the numbers. Everyone was called VC. To get the full picture, Nick Terse's Kill Everything That Moves is essential reading. History is repeating itself. Not only is the number exactly uh, so. uh, indifferent, uh, it's only also a question of numbers. The... Uh, they, they, uh, every, every civilian, man, woman, or child that they killed with their uh, incredible bombardment, uh, I mean, relentless uh, 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 flying fortresses dropping. Second World War bombs. Uh, watch Apocalypse Now to see what it looked like. Uh, every person that they killed, they said they was a communist. Just like mm. every person that they're killing in Gaza, they try to claim is Hamas. The difference, yeah. one hopes, is that whilst there were enough fools in the 1960s to believe 
what they now know to have been a bright shining lie, uh, one hopes that in the succeeding generations and in the experience of succeeding wars uh, that most people in the world know that Israel is not killing Hamas. Practically the last thing in the world they're killing is Hamas. They're killing and scalding and burning and gouging and mutilating and maiming little children. And I, I don't know about you, I'm sick of looking at scorched children. I cannot understand how any human being could look at what we are looking at and not be against it. How anyone could sign up to be a friend of Friend, capital F, friend of I Israel, know, I know. when they see I on know. their own phones what Israel is doing. How is that possible? How is that possible? The Tell only me. thing they're doing is pointing, pointing at us, criticizing them, uh, and calling us anti Semites. It is unbelievable. Um, another um, reminder it's incredible. Man Guy Cheng from Canada says yesterday, March the 20th, was the 21st anniversary of the illegal invasion of Iraq by the US. The US, the, the US falsely claimed that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction program to justify the invasion and subsequent occupation of the country. I'm just mentioning this to Mr. Galloway because I know he cares. Well, I know you care, it's more than you care. I know that Iraq is like your second name and isn't it incredible that we've reached the 21st an anniversary of it? Yes, uh, I made this point in my speech in the House this evening. Uh, I hope people look it up uh, when it's up there on social media. Uh, I only made this caveat that although it was the worst decision Parliament ever made, certainly since the First World War, at least the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister subjected themselves to relentless criticism, questioning, and indeed a vote. So it, it wasn't Tony Blair alone that took us into the disaster of the Iraq war. It was the MPs that voted for it. And each and every one of them, jointly and severally, will be responsible in history for that grotesquely bad decision. But now we have a situation where an unelected prime minister and an unelected foreign secretary are sending British troops all over the world, not only without Parliament deciding to do so, but absenting themselves from even the remotest questioning about it. In the case of David Cameron, I mean, where would you find David Cameron? Where? How could I, as an elected MP, even find David Cameron? Not not, not, not to mention having the right to ask him a question as to what he was doing in our name with our armed forces. Back to you, guys. You think that we? You think that we? Uh, you think that we learned from past mistakes? Uh, finally, I just want to conclude by announcing that uh, you are going to do something new, something groundbreaking this Friday. Uh, it's called yes. a Twitter. Sp yes. Uh, Twitter Spaces are a big thing. Uh, you should know. Um, and um, our friend Suleiman Ahmed, uh, who, 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 we've had, uh, who we've had on the show before, he is hosting one and you will be uh, the main guest on it. And we will be talking about the Rochdale victory and the campaign of the Workers' Party of Great Britain in the upcoming uh, elections. And when is that? It's on Friday, uh, I know, but at what time? So it will be this coming Friday, the 22nd of March, 9 p.m. UK, 5 p.m. New York, uh, East Coast. And um, uh, so everyone on X, uh, they can tune in to Suleiman Ahmed's um, uh, Twitter, which is called Sheikh Suleiman. I believe uh, a picture is supposed to show up. Here we go. Um, there, have, there we have got his um, account's name, Sheikh. Suleiman. Okay, we will okay. be sharing it on the modes and on our on your own uh, Twitter handle, so people can make sure they tune in and uh, learn more 
about a Workers' Party of Great Britain's activities for the upcoming elections. Well, later you can explain to me what a Twitter space is, but I'll definitely be there at the appointed time. So if you want to see me, if you see me, if you hear me, I don't hear, know yeah, which, hear. I'll yeah. definitely be there. Thank you very much, Gayatri. See you after the show. Almost 35,000 people have now voted and overwhelmingly they denounce the idea that criticizing Israel is in any way anti-Semitic. 99%, 94, 96, 96% all say no. Now, just a reminder, if you're dipping in and out of the show, you can download the full show as a podcast from wherever you get your podcast from by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. It's being downloaded all around the world. Time for two calls at least. Robert in Humberside. Go ahead, Robert. Um, good evening, George, and thank you for taking the call. And uh... Congratulations to you, Welcome. as everybody else has said to you over the past. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You, you. You, you do very good work. And I'm what, 81 now, and I've watched your career during that time, and uh, you're tremendous. However, today I was slightly concerned because um, I do believe the royal family's uh, situation is private. And I think it's, we need to keep it like that. I'm not happy with all the, what people believe is going to happen, et cetera, et cetera. They could well be true, but it's private to them. Why, why do you say that, Robert, when we pay for it and they are our heads of state? Uh, George, you and I won't agree with this. Whether we pay for it or not, whoever it was, it's private. It's something I've always believed in. I'm a great supporter of uh, the king. And uh, I am the, the supporter of the royal family. Now, I am of a coloured gentleman. I don't need to tell you. You don't need to really know that. But I am. But I'm very supportive. And when I was a little boy, uh, uh, King Charles, or at the time he wasn't the king then, he, I always felt so comfortable when he came round to visit people where the normal Caucasian, they, that wasn't the case. Well, of course, that's a perfectly legitimate point of view, Robert. I wouldn't seek to dissuade you from it, but my own view is very clear. Uh, if you are paying millions to a family, actually scores of millions to a family, that they are worth billions as a result of the position they hold, when they are amongst the country's biggest landlords and earners, you have a right to know if something untoward is going on. You have at least the right to see their picture contemporaneously. That's my view. You have a different one. I take my hat off to you. And long may your lum reek, as we say in Scotland. Long life to you. Michael is in Dublin on the Irish Prime Minister standing down. Go ahead, Michael. Good evening, George. Excellent show, as always. Um, I'd like to make a few Thank comments you. on uh, Leo Varadkar standing down. Now, uh, mm -hmm. I won't uh, undermine the, the credit that you gave to, to him for facing up to Genocide Joe when he went over there. That was good. That was good. And I, he, he did uh, achieve quite a lot. Jordan, his uh, t shirt ship. Now, um, the, Le the Fine Gael Party have been at the forefront of the campaign to get Ireland to join NATO for the last nearly 30 years. So that's one thing that has to be taken into consideration. Another thing that has to be in consideration about Leo standing down 10 of his TDs have announced that they won't run again. The Irish political scene is in a total ferment. It's affecting all the political parties. There will be a very large number of independents elected, like yourself, George, like yourself. Probably it might be inspired by your, your success, but there will be a huge number of independents elected in the next election. And his standing down 
is important to what's going to happen to the major parties in six in four or ten weeks' time when the local elections come. I'm actually standing in the local election myself as an independent. And uh, things are going to change around here big time. People are fed up. The referendum, the 75% of people who voted in the referendum against the government's proposal to take my mother out of the constitution. My God. It woke, it woke the whole country up when they put that proposal before us. Well, uh, sorry, I lost that last bit, Michael, but the, the, the truth is, the, uh, if ever there were two cheeks of the same backside, it would have to be Fina Foyle and Fina Gale, uh, who fought a phony war for a hundred years, but between whom there is no substantial difference of any kind at all. You couldn't slip sixpence between these two cheeks. They are that close. They are a tightly clenched buttock. They are a tightly clenched anus. And out of the anus, you can only expect the kind of ordure that these two parties have dropped upon the great people of Ireland. Uh, Sinn Féin uh, have lost a little bit of ground, but they are easily the largest party in the running uh, in the elections, and I hope that they win. But I do hope that independents, by the score, are also elected to the European Parliament and to the uh, to the uh, forthcoming uh, Doyle, uh, which must surely soon be voted upon, and definitely in the local elections. Uh, I, I hope that Claire Daly and Mick Wallace get back uh, to the European Parliament when these elections take place, and I believe that they will. Uh, Michael, thank you for the call. I need to make way for the legend that is Norma in Bristol. The last call of the evening. Norma, welcome. Hello, George. Um, I just wanted to make a comment quickly um, because I was listening to Loki. And although he is brilliant, um, it got a bit too complicated for me, all the ins and outs of everything. But what I do know, George, is that the USA and Netanyahu, etc., they're far too connected for any good solution to come out of Gaza and the Palestinians. You know, I mean, the forces of like greed and evil, they're, they're too strong for the forces of good. And it's very sad, but that's my sort of comments, which is quite depressing. Well, it's, uh, it's a good one. I do think that uh, the interview with Loki uh, probably requires and definitely merits a second viewing, a second, third, and fourth viewing, because uh, as is typical with him, his sheer genius is in tracing the links between this and that, between him and him, her and her. He, he's effectively drawing a word diagram which connects all the dots and it repays careful study because the dots are all joined. Uh, these things that happen in different parts of the world, different parts of the country, are not random, disconnected phenomena. Uh, they are entirely connected one with the other and Loki is the man who not only can trace them, but can retain them in his head. No wonder he's able to remember all his songs. He connects them and he remembers them and he imparts them to you and me. And I personally uh, feel greatly indebted to him uh, for doing so. Thank you, uh, Norma, for that, the last call, alas, I've overshot again, and this is the end of the show. But the good news is, God willing, I'll be back again on Sunday at 7 p.m. UK time with the Mothership, with the Sunday edition of the Mother of All talk shows. I'm staggered by the number of people now watching this show, watching the stream and watching the clips and spreading them, sharing them. This is a multi-million viewer show. It's the mother 
of all talk shows. See you Sunday. God willing.